to the Real Estate Marketing Podcast. My name is Jerome Lewis. I am your host for today. The Real Estate Marketing Podcast is a podcast that has where we talk marketing, tech, business, and leadership. We talk these things for real estate agents, real estate investors, and real estate entrepreneurs. Real Estate Marketing Podcast is a podcast that has two purposes. Purpose number one, to educate and inform our audience and our listeners. Purpose number two, Evan, to spotlight you, your business, your service, or your product in a way that provides value to you, including market exposure and content creation. With that, we have a very special guest, Evan Curtis. Evan Curtis is an executive director of investments for Vanamore. Prior to joining Vanamore, Evan spent five years at Wedgwoods as the director of investor relations and commercial finance, where he oversaw two private funds with a combined AUM of $200 million, raised capital for a multi family syndications and source, and secured over $300 million of debt on a portfolio of over 2,000 doors in Texas and California. Evan also spent 11 years at PIMCO, PIMCO, where he focused on real estate private equity funds, which included fundraising and ongoing management for a portfolio of funds with over 10 billion in capital commitments. Evan, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, Jerome. Really Absolutely. excited to be on. Thank you. So, uh, Evan, uh, that was an impressive bio. Tell us in your own words how you got to where you got to. Take us on a journey and what led you into like real estate syndication and some of those cool things that were in your bio. Yeah, happy, happy to. And uh, it, it, I feel like I've always kind of been pointed in the direction of ultimately going to kind of this this real estate syndication uh, side of the business. So, you know, PIMCO is where I first first started my career straight out of out of out of undergrad and and got to work with a ton of really really smart and knowledgeable people in the industry focused on a, sp- a broad spectrum of fixed income products really got a, a strong base in macroeconomics uh, understanding I mean PIMCO has always kind of been one of the, the global thought leaders as far as macroeconomics um, but while I was there I was kind of on the side, always interested in doing doing real estate uh, ventures over my my career as well, and was kind of pointing towards that direction as well at the at the, the Pimco side, and ultimately moved over to the hedge funds and private equity funds that focused on on real estate uh, related assets. And and again, it was a really good uh, diverse understanding of different types of types of real estate products I was exposed to there, both on the public and private debt and equity side. Um, so. After kind of moving on from Pimco, went a little bit closer to the to the deal side of things, which was at Wedgwood, where I was focused on the funds that we had. And Wedgwood is a kind of a broad, uh, vertically integrated real estate real estate company. Um, so was was where I was kind of wanting to be at Wedgwood, focused on multifamily value add apartments as well as overseeing the funds for the company. Um, but ultimately, wanted to kind of venture off at a at a smaller smaller shop. Um, and really was was waiting for kind of the right timing from a number of things, personal market um, perspective. And I, I think joining Vanamore earlier earlier in 2023 kind of had a number of these things align. And you know it's getting really interesting from a from a market timing. And, and I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit more their perspective with what's happening in the real estate side of things. Okay, thank you. So, you why? What? real estate versus like other ways that you can like you know become wealthy or be successful in business or take on a mission i've always been a a numbers kind of analysis guy um i also like kind of just the tangible aspect of of real estate it's it's something that kind of i was grow i've always grown up with understanding my family has been involved in the real estate business so i had a kind of early exposure at a, at a younger age and has I've just seen how you know that, that a, a skilled operator can really you know grow wealth over a long a long term horizon, and I've always been kind of interested in in really that that longer term, and and also I mean I, I really like the macro side of real estate and how how it works. I mean I've always I went to school for economics degree, again at Pimco I was getting a ton of, of macro knowledge, and I've always been really really highly interested in the macroeconomics piece and how that really plays into what's going on in in real estate and we're seeing it we're seeing it firsthand now when you say macro can you help us understand what that means like what does that mean to someone that doesn't understand like economics or real estate 
Sure. People will speak about macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macro is really that that top down view of, you know, understanding things at kind of the highest levels that ultimately filter down into how things affect supply and demand at kind of the the, the lower consumer level. But I mean, a, an example of, of, of macro is what's happening in interest rates right now in the current environment. I mean, the Fed, I think most people know that the Fed has been raising rates for for a while now. And, you know, we are at a much higher higher Fed funds right now than than previously. So that's that's an example of, of something that's happening in the, in the macro landscape. You know, GDP at you know the, the U.S. level versus um, you know something that's happening at a company level might be considered micro. Okay, I was going to ask you like, what is what's a good example of what's micro? Yeah, people will talk about you know what, what's happening at prop. I'll keep it to real estate. So. On the micro level, you might talk about property fundamentals. That is the micro side of things. So you have the macro that's impacting impacting real estate right now, which is highly impacted just in the capital markets. So the cost of debt is more expensive. So that's a macro event. Whereas you have property fundamentals are still actually performing very strong, and you know occupancy rates are are still strong. You're not you're not seeing a spike in kind of bad debt, you know, outside of idiosyncratic situations. Um, so that's kind of a the, the macro piece plus an example of a, of a micro piece okay uh you mentioned i want to i want to play uh you know dictionary you mentioned the fed what is the fed who is the fed what is that like how does that tie into real estate the, the, the fed is the group of governing board uh board members that that uh determine what the right level of uh, they, they have a number of tools in their tool belt. So they are ultimately seeking to have uh, employment and inflation at kind of their long term average uh, long long term goals. So they have a number of tools that they can use to influence that. And the, the one that's kind of the biggest that's been in the spotlight is moving the Fed funds rate, which is the short term uh, borrowing rate. Um, and that ultimately impacts kind of the cost of, of money and as money is more expensive it restricts the economy um there's less kind of money flow there's less borrowing out there because ultimately they're they're trying to bring down inflation everyone i think knows that inflation is, is the problem it's it's well above kind of their two percent targeted goal so they're using one of the strongest tools in their toolkit to try and bring that down which has been to aggressively raise interest rates and I mean, we've seen the impact we've seen transaction volumes really slow down I mean, 70 percent year over year on the real estate multifamily side so you know it, it, it's happening but it doesn't happen overnight the private markets especially on the real estate side it, it's a longer process and we're, we're seeing it kind of play out on how the ultimate impacts of that 500 basis point move up in rates will will, will play through and roll through the market thanks and so another word gdp another abbreviation what is that Gross domestic product. It's just a, it's a measurement of the overall um, growth rate of the the U.S. economy. So it has a number of pieces uh, involved: the government infrastructure spending, consumer spending, and um, investments. So it kind of just takes everything and ultimately puts it into one number that says GDP is increasing or declining at X percent per per quarter or per, per year. Okay, and how does uh, how does the cost of debt factor into investing in commercial and multifamily real estate? Sure, the the cost of debt is a is a big factor because most real estate transactions use some level of debt for an acquisition. So there's certain certain uh, folks who can buy something all cash, and maybe the debt doesn't impact their their underwriting and their modeling but the vast majority do. Um, so you are ultimately borrowing at some cost. And from 2020 to 20, first half of 2022, that cost was, was really low. Um, and so when you could borrow at a low cost, that ultimately led to stronger demand and, and increased valuations for real estate because people are able to buy more aggressively because the debt cost was so cheap. So they're buying an asset that they're expecting to cash flow at some dollar amount. And 
they're borrowing debt against that at some percentage. So they were able if there's a, if there's kind of a, a spread between the two, then you can you know have positive positive cash flow on top of um, your your initial equity invested. Why? So uh, how can I phrase this? <sighs> All right, debt. Some people say that is bad. Some people say that is good. What is your perspective on debt and how can we like, should we use it at all or should we only use it in certain scenarios? Like give us your perspective and your professional input on like how to use or avoid debt. And we might get philosophical here, Jerome. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways you could answer, answer this question from a, from a personal perspective. I, I'd say debt can't give a, a, a blanket response for debt because it's it's very uh, relative and, and it takes context to understand if it's good or bad for someone and there's different levels like some debt may not be may not be bad but too much debt could certainly be bad so it certainly depends on on circumstances a lot of people will say that you know folks your 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 viewers who own a home and maybe they purchased it I don't know within the last five seven ten years, and they're able to lock in 30 year fixed rate debt roughly at 3%. Um, I would call that debt good debt, given kind of the historical borrowing cost and kind of where we are today. So debt that's that's fixed for a long period of time and is low relative to kind of where we would expect rates to, to be now and in the future, I would argue that that is, is good debt, um, assuming that they can service it. So that's where you get into how much debt is is definitely a question to ask here. So on the commercial side, you know, I, I think now is probably not the time to be putting on you know overly aggressive debt. So keeping kind of fifty-five to sixty-five percent, maybe seventy percent loan loan to value is is kind of where most folks are operating, which which looks different than where some folks were acquiring, you know, 2020 to 2020, first half 2022, there was a lot of, there was a lot of fairly aggressive um, operators out there buying up to 80% debt, floating rate debt on, on these properties. And that, you know, for one, was driving prices higher because the demand was there and people were purchasing aggressively. Um, and two, now there's, there's probably going to be some some distress that comes out from having too much debt. So I think it's hard to answer just what is debt good or bad, but I'd say it's, it's definitely circumstantial. And um, I, I personally think there's there's absolutely ways that debt is is good um, for folks. Okay, and, and so you brought up like like debt could be good, especially like for like homeowners, um, which which makes me think like which makes me think. Okay, why like for you? Why you why commercial versus like residential in terms of like real estate investing? Like, what's your reasoning and your perspective on that? I guess right now at my current company, we're a little bit in between. Like, I like the residential okay. space because of the long term. Um, the long term demand is is effectively always gonna always gonna be there. The cliche of you know that everybody has to live somewhere is 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 largely true. So. Um, I think on the multifamily side versus the single family side, I think there's a lot of kind of efficiency gains that can be had of operating a portfolio of multifamily products versus a portfolio of, of single family rentals, for example. Not that I think single family rentals are bad, bad by any means. I just think that you can um, you can achieve economies of scale much easier on a multifamily portfolio. I mean, think about a building that's 200 units. You have 200 units sitting in, you know, one individual space versus a portfolio of 200 single-family rentals, for example, which is can be spread out geographically, and then it's just less efficient to run, uh, most likely. And then the question, I guess, is why multifamily versus some other commercial commercial types? Um, I like, I, I do like other commercial types as well, and I kind of look at it personally, I guess, but. Um, from a business perspective, I think that multifamily makes a lot of sense. There's, there's, there's a good backstop for for financing on multifamily, which is from the the, um, uh, the agencies Fannie and Freddie. 
um, as well as just long-term trends with with being able to, um, like we said, you know, provide a provide a, a good that will always be needed by by your kind of customers or renters. What is uh, like, so you mentioned like some of the other asset classes that you potentially like, what's like the second, right? After multifamily, what do you like second? Like what's the second priority? I mean, I, I like, I like industrial. I like the multi-tenant, smaller kind of multi-tenant industrial. Problem is the valuations on that stuff. There's a lot of people who, who really like it and it made a whole lot of sense and the valuations on that have maybe even outpaced the valuations on on multifamily investing but i think that that product also has a good kind of long-term projection it's it's tough to it's tough to build that for less than kind of the current cost of of um of where you can acquire it and you know where inflation is going i think it's going to continue to be tough to to build new product in that space that makes sense so you have kind of a, a good supply demand story for existing buildings, especially in kind of strong infill locations. Um, so I, I do like that that product type as well a lot going forward. Uh, you're you're very educated, very well educated. How do you acquire your education and how do you stay up to date on the market and the trends and things that are going on out there in the world? And I'm a I'm a real estate junkie. This is what I this is what I like to do. I, I I look at a lot of deals, even if they're not in our wheelhouse, like in the multifamily wheelhouse, like all, all kind of back of the envelope underwrite deals on the industrial space. Um, I have a, I have a number of people that I kind of talk to in my network that are outside of outside of the multifamily space as well. Um, I have kind of personally invested in, in a few different spaces as well over the years. So I kind of like to just keep track of that. And I mean, I, I do a lot of I do a lot of reading. Um, I do, I do list, I do like a number of different kind of podcasts and other folks that I think there's just a lot of good information that's out there and available to folks nowadays. Like I like Twitter a lot too. I'm not sure how much of you or your audience uses Twitter, but there's some really good um, information that people, people will post on Twitter that I am a, a reader of as well. How, how can someone learn from you? You know what, what I think right now with my transition to vanamore we're a small company i mean we're a, a shop of three people right now and you know one of the things that i'm looking to do is is kind of get my my name out there increase my network and part of that is just talking to people i i have always enjoyed kind of speaking to people helping to to educate as best as i can i feel like i have at this point a decent amount of of knowledge that people would find interesting and i'm i'm generally open to to speaking with people if they're if they're interested to kind of to talk and you know a lot of times you find that that i learn from those folks as well even though they're maybe maybe looking to learn from me so that's also why i think i like doing it and and i've seen you know a lot of people kind of grow into I, I'm, I'm coming up on 20 years kind of total industry experience at this point and, and i've just been going through some of my old network and people that interned intern they were they were interns in my team you know at, at pimco a long time ago now they're you know running these these big running corporations or they're extremely high up at kind of the c-suite level and it's like wow I mean, these, these people have really taken off and you know you never you, you never know kind of where somebody will ultimately go so i i really like to, to meet as many of these folks who are, who are really interested in real estate business as i can uh, how can like i'm like all right i just heard the podcast with evan evan and jerome I'm interested in investing in real estate, but I don't want to learn all of that stuff or be as smart as Evan. How can I still be? How can I still get involved? Yeah, I mean, you can you can visit our website at vanamore.com, V-A-N-A-M-O-R.com, and contact information is there. Um, Vanamore, we we um, you have to be an accredited investor to invest in the offerings that we have. Um, we have done. Uh, 506B and 506C, or excuse me, only 506B offerings in, in the past. So um, we have to have uh, a relationship and understand that, that you are a accredited investor before you're able to kind of see see deals. But um, we have a portal where you can you can access and kind of submit your information on and 
and have a have a discussion to understand a little bit more about what we're doing and what we're what we're seeing because again like i like i said we're th things are getting interesting transaction volume is really slow right now but but things are definitely getting interesting as far as what what we're seeing when, when you, you say accredited investor right we understand that but some people don't what is an accredited investor there's a couple rules that can satisfy an accredited investor um i think that the primary the most common one that our people are able to satisfy with is if you have a, a million dollars net worth excluding your primary residence um, so there's an income one as well if you made i think it's two hundred thousand dollars per year uh, as a single individual or 300 as a kind of a joint household over the last two years i believe that's it but um, don't don't quote me exactly there's there's some information on the sec website um, but jerome you might know that information as well yeah uh something i don't know very well is what is a 501 and a 503 you know 501c right a 503b 506b and a 506c okay they're they're types of private offerings that a lot that's the common structure that real estate syndication um operators offer so 506b um you you can't publicly market your offering so if it's a 506b i couldn't just i couldn't just go on to linkedin and say hey i have this this offering for you know whatever property blah 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 here's the return profile because i'm i'm risking potentially you know soliciting to folks who are not accredited investors and it's a um an sec violation so 506b you have to have an existing relationship with with that person and, and kind of know that they are and they need to kind of provide some some documentation and evidence that they are uh, an accredited investor and so 506c is an offering that where you you have a little bit different kind of framework in place but basically you can go out and and market it broadly to, to folks you still have to be an accredited investor in either in either offering but it's really about the way that it's marketed it's the primary difference thank you um let's see let me go to the questions oh that's what i wanted to ask you how can someone add immediate value to you or your business so Creative. so a really good example for me sometimes we don't understand it. I, would, I would be like okay buy a book buy a course follow me on social media subscribe to youtube so that's like a good example of in my case it could be something different for you or something similar so what is that like sure that's helpful i, I, I mean i would say reach out to me on linkedin connection okay. there it helps um the, the, you probably there's there's a good amount of folks who are who are deal sourcers they're out there you know on the phones talking to brokers i'm doing that as well but helping to find deals is tough right now. So that's definitely a way if you are that person who, who, who has a knack for finding sellers who want to sell, then that would be something. Um, another one is, is, is just, uh, re reaching out. If you know, you, you want to kind of create a relationship and ultimately you're interested in investing in, in real estate over the, the longer run and just kind of contacting to have a, have a talk and, you know, understand, what we see out there. So I think you answered this, the, the next question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it to you anyway. How can someone add long-term value to you or your business? Yeah, long, I think long-term value is similar. Is long-term value from an kind of an investor perspective, which is we, we like to create partnerships with our investors. I mean, we, we think that we have a structure that is incentive alignment within within how we we create it um so there's the investor side there's also kind of the, the vendor side which is again it, it could be it could be kind of the, the deal sourcing it could be property management it could be construction management because i mean we're doing value add deals in these places so we use we use local um third-party property management but um we we are also we're also open to you know different types of different operator property management operators as well as folks on the construction side so um yeah okay uh what are three books you recommend to the audience and why three books i so 
I don't read a ton of I don't read a ton of real estate books, so my books are a little bit. Uh, That's okay. Uh, call me call me nerdy here, but I like the the fantasy fiction genre. So my okay. one, of, one of my favorite authors is Brandon Sanderson. Okay. And he has he has a um, series called the Stormlight Archives. Great books, and there's more than more than three of those. If you have uh, if you if you need an audio book as well, the narrators are fantastic. So I'm going to use that for all three of my books because it's a series. Okay. So Brandon, Brandon Sanderson. Yeah. Okay. All right. I could get, I, I like fantasy stuff too. So oh, I can get down with that. You won't be, you won't be disappointed. I, all right. my perspective. All right. What is one question you wish I asked you and how would you have answered that question? I would say we didn't dive into why I think I said it maybe three times that real estate's getting interesting right now, but I don't think we okay. we actually got into it. Okay. So you know that again I spoke about and alluded to it. There was maybe some aggressive purchasing that happened between 2020 up to 2022 with you know highly leveraged floating rate debt. You're starting to see some of that stuff come out in the headlines. Um, there's been one very large operator that has had to kind of give back the keys on their portfolio and uh, that, that they had uh, reasonable size. And I mean, there was even an article in the Wall Street Journal about this particular operator. I won't, I won't say their name, but so you're starting to see some things come out kind of publicly on folks who kind of purchased maybe too aggressively. But really, I think we're starting to see some of that as well on uh, come through on on deals that we're underwriting. Like there, there's there's definitely the expense component side of, of kind of operating multifamily has continued to creep up and you've really seen it in um, certain areas more so than other like Texas, for example, and, and coastal states. You've seen you've seen insurance premiums really, really rise um, well above kind of the, the, the already high kind of thing, the inflation trend. You've seen property taxes in Texas again, in particular. You've seen it rise relatively fast, really fast, kind of year over year. Um, and then you have the revenue side as well, which is now kind of moderating. We had been seeing just really large rent growth year over year, um, and people able to capture a huge rent premium. So the growth in expenses was offset by a larger growth in revenue. So so the deals still made a lot of sense, and they made they made good money. But now you know now that we have expenses still being elevated you have the revenue piece of the pie kind of coming down so that's squeezing your margin and then and then factor in the the folks that have floating rate debt now um then you really have some potential for negative cash flow on deals and you know we're we're starting to see some some folks who are who have a little bit of a little bit of trouble in their financials and you hadn't really seen that before i mean we're even seeing some things where some operators are selling are selling for a loss. You know, they understand that they have to, they, they maybe need to get out of this property and maybe even for no fault of their own. Like they ran their business plan as expected, but what's happened in the capital markets with rates is kind of put them in a position where they need to sell and they need to take a modest loss. And when's the last time that anyone had to take a loss in real estate, you know, outside of some idiosyncratic situation? It's probably 2012, right? Like the real estate market has basically gone one direction for over 10 years. And now it looks like we finally hit the inflection point, which was mid 2022 when rates really started shooting up. So we've seen the, the move in capital markets being that move in interest rates impact um, folks. But we haven't, again, we haven't really seen the fundamentals on these properties deteriorate much. Like we're still seeing strong occupancy again. And you know we're still seeing overall properties being being well run. Um, so all that long long way of saying that that we are starting to see some some interesting opportunities here as far as pricing being pretty far off from kind of the, the highs that it was in 2020 late 2021 early 2022. Um, so those markets that have good long term fundamentals and demographics, I think are are likely going to present some opportunities here granted they ran up a lot you know just like everything else did but they're they're pulling back some here as well and maybe there's kind of some short-term turbulence in the economy and the, maybe the property specifically that you need to overcome but 
long term, we we definitely like some some of these markets that we might be able to transact in and hold for five, seven years. What what are some things we could have done to prevent what's happening now? Like, what did we the people that are like losing taking lot like what should they have done or avoided or how should they have adjusted? Yeah, it's a hard one because nobody nobody really sees it, and I mean I can't say it. it's not like I had a crystal ball and and knew that this the pace of rate increases were going to come. You can look back and it's kind of easy to say, oh yeah, of course they had to raise rates. Look at all the money and, and you know all the stimulus that was done. But I think it's it's hard to keep that pers- when when you can borrow at three. Per- so floating rate debt, I think is a good example here. Maybe one one thing when you can borrow floating rate debt at let's say three percent because that's roughly where you could borrow it at. Or you could have you could borrow floating rate debt at three percent at a little bit higher leverage, or you can borrow fixed rate debt at let's just say three and a half percent at a little bit lower leverage. Most people were taking the floating rate debt because that was juicier for the returns, and you know you ultimately needed the returns to probably win win the deal because things were getting bid aggressively. But if you bought if you locked in that three and a half percent debt for ten years, you're likely in a much better position to kind of ride out any near-term volatility that's going to come because you don't have that same that same stress so you know it's 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 always easy to kind of take the most aggressive terms when everything is going well and it's hard to keep that perspective and uh, you know i can't say that i would have seen it either so okay got you got you um i appreciate that you are very well educated um how can listeners tell us again how can listeners find out more about you online yeah, again, you can search for me on, on LinkedIn, just my Evan Curtis, um, Evan Curtis in Long Beach. Um, or you can kind of get my my contact information from the Vanamore.com website, V-A-N-A-M-O-R.com. And my contact information is there. I would love to would love to hear from, from folks. And... All right, Evan, uh, if you could close us out with one word, no explanation, what would that word be? Patience. Patience. Why patience? Because opportunities are coming. We just got to keep looking. Okay. All right, Evan, this has been excellent. I appreciate you for doing this. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to close us out and then uh, I'm going to chat with you for a little bit in the back room. Thanks a lot, Jerome. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. My pleasure.